education under No Child Left Behind is based on not diversity, but conformity. What schools are encouraged to do is to find out what kids can do across a very narrow spectrum of achievement. One of the effects of No Child Left Behind has been to narrow the focus onto the so-called STEM disciplines. They're very important. Well, I'm not here to argue against science and math. On the contrary, they're necessary, but they're not sufficient. A real education has to give equal weight to the arts, the humanities, to physical education. An awful lot of kids... Sorry, thank you. One estimate uh, in America currently is that something like 10% of kids getting on that way um, are being diagnosed with various conditions uh, under the broad uh, title of uh, attention deficit disorder, ADHD. I'm not saying there's no such thing. I just don't believe it's an epidemic like this. If you sit kids down hour after hour doing low-grade clerical work, <laughs> don't be surprised if they start to fidget, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the... Children are not, for the most part, suffering from a psychological condition. They're suffering from childhood. <laughs> you know, and... <laughs> and I know this because I spent my early life as a child. I went through the whole thing. And... <laughs> Kids prosper best with a broad curriculum that celebrates their various talents, not just a small range of them. And by the way, the arts aren't just important because they improve math scores, they're important because they speak to parts of children's being which are otherwise untouched. The second... Sorry, thank you. Um, the second uh, principle that drives human life and flourishing is curiosity. If you can light the spark of curiosity in a child, they will learn without any further assistance very often. Children are natural learners. It's a real uh, achievement to put that particular ability out or to stifle it. Um, curiosity is the kind of engine of achievement. Now, the reason I say this is because uh, one of the effects of the current culture here, if I can say so, has been to deprofessionalize teachers. There is no system in the world or any school in the country that's better than its teachers. Teachers are the lifeblood of the success of schools. But teaching is a creative profession. Teaching properly conceived is not a delivery system. You know, you're not there just to pass on received information. Great teachers do that. But what great teachers also do is mentor, stimulate, provoke, engage. You see, in the end, education is about learning. If there's no learning going on, there's no education going on. And people can spend an awful lot of time discussing education without ever discussing learning. The whole point of education is to get people to learn. Other uh, creatures, um, like the crows, aren't very good at doing anything in particular, but they're extremely good at learning about lots of different environments. And of course, we human beings are way out on the end of the distribution, like the crows. We have bigger brains relative to our bodies by far than any other animal. We're smarter, we're more flexible, we can learn more. We survive in more different environments. We've migrated to cover the world and even go to outer space. And our babies and children are dependent on us for much longer than the babies of any other species. My son is 23, and <laughs> uh, at least until they're 23, we're still popping those worms into those little open mouths. All right, why would we see this correlation? Well, an idea is that that strategy, that learning strategy, is an extremely powerful, great strategy for getting on in the world, but it has one big disadvantage. And that one big disadvantage is that until you actually do all that learning, you're going to be helpless. So you don't want to have the mastodon charging at you and be saying to yourself, a slingshot or maybe a spear might work, which would actually be better. You want to know all that before the mastodons actually show up. And the way that evolution seems to have solved that problem is with a kind of division of labor. So the idea is that we have this early period when we're completely protected, we don't have to do anything, all we have to do is learn. And then as adults, we can take all those things that we learned when we were babies and children and actually put them to work to do things out there in the world. So one way of thinking about it is that babies and young children are like the research and development division of the human species. 
So they're the protected blue sky guys who just have to go out and learn and have good ideas, and we're production and marketing. We have to take all those ideas that we learned when we were children and、uh, actually put them to use. Another way of thinking about it is instead of thinking about babies and children as being like defective grown-ups, we should think about them as being a different developmental stage of the same species, kind of like caterpillars and butterflies, except that they're actually the brilliant butterflies who are flitting around the garden and exploring, and we're the caterpillars who are inching along our narrow grown-up adult path. If this is true, if these babies are designed to learn, and this evolutionary story would say children are for learning, that's what they're for, we might expect that they would have really powerful learning mechanisms. And in fact, the baby's brain seems to be the most powerful learning computer on the planet. But real computers are actually getting to be a lot better. And there's been a revolution in our understanding of machine learning recently, and it all depends on the ideas of this guy, the Reverend Thomas Bayes, who was a statistician and mathematician in the 18th century. And essentially, what Bayes did was to provide a mathematical way, using probability theory, to characterize, to describe the way that scientists find out about the world. So what scientists do is they have a hypothesis that they think might be likely to start with. They go out and test it against the evidence. The evidence makes them change that hypothesis. Then they test that new hypothesis, and so on and so forth. And what Bayes showed was a mathematical way that you could do that. And that mathematics is at the core of the best machine learning programs that we have now. And some ten years ago, I suggested that babies might be doing the same thing. So if you want to know what's going on underneath those beautiful brown eyes, I think it actually looks something like this. This is Reverend Bayes's notebook. So I think those babies are actually making complicated calculations with conditional probabilities that they're revising to figure out how the world works. All right, now that might seem like an even taller order to actually demonstrate, because after all, if you ask even grown-ups about statistics, they look extremely stupid. How could it be that children are doing statistics? So to test this, we used a machine that we have called the Blicket Detector. This is a box that lights up and plays music when you put some things on it and not others. And using this very simple machine, my lab and others have done dozens of studies showing just how good babies are at learning about the world. Let me mention just one that we did with Tamara Kushner, my student. If I showed you this detector, you would be likely to think, to begin with, that the way to make the detector go would be to put a block on top of the detector. But actually, this detector works in a bit of a strange way, because if you wave a block over the top of the detector, something you wouldn't ever think of to begin with, the detector will actually activate two out of three times. Whereas if you do the likely thing, put the block on the detector, it will only activate two out of six times.、Um, so the unlikely hypothesis actually has stronger evidence. It looks as if the waving is a more effective strategy than the other strategy. So we did just this. We gave four-year-olds this pattern of evidence, and we just asked them to make it go. And sure enough, the four-year-olds used the evidence to wave the object on top of the detector. Now there are two things that are really interesting about this. The first one is again. Remember, these are four-year-olds. They're just learning how to count, but unconsciously, they're doing these quite complicated calculations that will give them a conditional probability measure. And the other interesting thing is that they are using that evidence to get to an idea, get to a hypothesis about the world that seems very unlikely to begin with. And in studies we've just been doing in my lab, similar studies, we've shown that four-year-olds are actually better at finding out an unlikely hypothesis than adults are when we give them exactly the same task. So in these circumstances, the children are using statistics to find out about the world. But after all, scientists also do experiments, and we wanted to see if children are doing experiments. When children do experiments, we call it getting into everything or else playing. And there's been a bunch of interesting experiment、uh, studies recently that have shown that this playing around is really a kind of experimental research program. Here's one from Christine Laguerre's lab. What Christine did was use our blicket detectors, and what she did was show children that yellow ones made it go and red ones didn't, and then she showed them an anomaly. And what you'll see is that this little boy will go through five hypotheses in the space of two minutes. Okay, so he's just his first hypothesis has just been falsified. 
nothing. <laughs> this one's like a hook, and this one's not. That's okay, he's got his experimental is. notebook out. scientists will recognize that expression of despair, right? Oh, it's because this needs to be like this, and this needs to be like that. Okay, hypothesis two. That's why. Now this is his next idea. He tells the experimenter to do this, to try putting it out over onto the other location. Not working either. Oh, because the light goes only to here, not here. Oh, the bottom of this box has electricity in here, but this doesn't have electricity. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the fourth oh. hypothesis. It's, it's lighting up! <laughs> so we need to put four. <laughs> hmm. So we need to put four on this one to make it light up and two on this one to make it light okay, up. Okay, there's the fifth hypothesis. Now that is a particularly... That is a particularly adorable and articulate little boy. But what Christine discovered is this is actually quite typical. If you look at the way children play, when you ask them to explain something, what they really do is do a series of experiments. This is actually pretty typical of four-year-olds. Well, what's it like to be this kind of creature? What's it like to be one of these brilliant butterflies who can test five hypotheses in two minutes? Well, if you go back to those psychologists and philosophers, a lot of them had said that babies and young children were barely conscious if they were conscious at all. And I think just the opposite is true. I think babies and children are actually more conscious than we are as adults. Now, here's what we know about how adult consciousness works. And adult attention and consciousness look kind of like a spotlight. So what happens for adults is we decide that something's relevant or important, we should pay attention to it. Our consciousness of that thing that we're attending to becomes extremely bright and vivid, and everything else sort of goes dark. And we even know something about the brain, the way the brain does this. So what happens when we pay attention is that the prefrontal cortex, the sort of executive part of our brain, sends a signal that makes a little part of our brain much more flexible, more plastic, better at learning, and shuts down activity in all the rest of our brains. So we have a very focused, purpose-driven kind of attention. Uh, if we look at babies and young children, we see something very different. I think babies and young children seem to have more of a lantern of consciousness than a spotlight of consciousness. So babies and young children are very bad at narrowing down to just one thing, but they're very good at taking in lots of information from lots of different sources at once. And if you actually look in their brains, you see that they're flooded with these neurotransmitters that are really good at inducing learning and plasticity, and the inhibitory parts haven't come on yet. So when we say that babies and young children are bad at paying attention, what we really mean is that they're bad at not paying attention. So they're bad at getting rid of all the interesting things that could tell them something and just looking at the thing that's important. That's the kind of attention, the kind of consciousness that we might expect from those butterflies who are designed to learn. Well, if we want to think about a way of getting a taste of that kind of baby consciousness as adults, I think the best thing is think about cases where we're put in a new situation that we've never been in before. When we fall in love with someone new, or when we're in a new city for the first time. And what happens then is not that our consciousness contracts, it expands, so that those three days in Paris seem to be more full of consciousness and experience than all the months of being a walking, talking, faculty meeting, attending zombie back home. <laughs> And by the way, that coffee, that wonderful coffee you've been drinking downstairs, actually mimics the effect of those baby neurotransmitters. So what's it like to be a baby? It's like being in love in Paris for the first time after you've had three double espressos, <laughs> which is, that's a fantastic way to be, but it does tend to leave you waking up crying at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, now, 
it's good to be a grown-up. I don't want to say too much about how wonderful babies are. It's good to be a grown-up. We can do things like tie our shoelaces and cross the street by ourselves. And it makes sense that we put a lot of effort into actually making babies think like adults do. But if what we want is to be like those butterflies, to have open-mindedness, open learning, imagination, creativity, innovation, maybe at least some of the time we should be getting the adults to start thinking more like children. <laughs>